Hi, everyone. Great to be here. We haven't had a, a panel, we haven't had a fireside here at this event for a while, so great to see you in person, Good Martin. Good to see you, Karen. Let's dive straight in. I want to start on your industry first. You witnessed explosive growth when setting up S4 to become a digitally first company. One commentator put it this way, a business model designed to vacuum up big tech's marketing budgets. Now, in 2024, there are layoffs across the industry. Clients are taking an axe to budgets. Just sketch out what's changed. Is this a cyclical trough that you've seen before or something more structural thanks to the AI story? Well, the, the, the irony about last year, 2023, is that despite the fact that the platforms, and there are only really six, and the numbers are really important for people to understand. I mean, the media market was about 950 billion last year. Uh, so getting towards a trillion. Uh, 650 billion of that was digital. Uh, Alphabet accounted for about 225 billion. These are ad revenues. Meta, about 125, so that's 350. And Amazon, on its way to 100 billion, was about 50 billion, having grown um, extremely strongly. Then you have the Eastern, those are the three Western. You have the Eastern platforms, Alibaba and Tencent, and of course, ByteDance, TikTok. We don't have numbers on Alibaba and Tencent, but we do have numbers uh, on TikTok within ByteDance, and ByteDance as a whole. ByteDance went from 60 billion in 22 to 90 billion last year, and TikTok outside China, my 950 number excludes China uh, for media as a whole, TikTok went from 10 to 20. Now last year, those six platforms on average were up in ad revenues by around 10, 12% on average. There was some sort of greater growth at, at Amazon at 25, and Meta recovered strongly. And the Eastern platforms did very well. The irony is they were cutting their spending on advertising and marketing. So 50% of our $1.2 billion of revenue last year came from the tech companies. Our top 13 clients are dominated by the, the platforms and the telecoms companies represented here in Barcelona. So you had that growth, but the 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 linear media were down in ad revenues by about 10 or 12%. So the, the linear networks like ABC, like CBS, like NBC were under huge pressure, not as badly as you will know from press, press and magazines over the previous years, but starting to feel the pressure. So you, the, the disparity between the two was plus 10, 12% on the platforms and minus 10 or 12% on linear TV on the top line at a time when they were both reducing their costs in advertising and marketing. And the spending was driven by the, the rise of the packaged goods companies in terms of marketing. What happened last year was the packaged goods companies increased their prices because of inflation, some quarters by 10 or 15%, particularly in Q1, Q2, and Q3. And that incremental money went into the platforms. So you're seeing this dispersion, and you see it here in Barcelona, that the real focus, particularly amongst the major packaged goods companies, but all companies, is on lower funnel work, on activation, on performance, on measurement, rather than up the funnel in brand work, because CEOs and indeed institutional investors demand stronger quarterly performance, like, like for like growth. So that's the big feature of 23. I think that will continue into 24, but clients are probably a little more uh, confident this year because last year, as you well know, interest rates were on their way up. This year, we don't know quite when, but they seem to be on their way down. So the general climate is a little bit better. This time last year, clients hadn't fixed their operating budgets let alone their marketing budgets because of the uncertainty. So the general picture is one of digital growth. The model that we have at S4, going back to your disruption um, description, is purely digital, data-driven. So AI plays to our strength. We were voted AI Agency of the Year last year for the first time, Adweek's first, first award in that area. 
faster, better, cheaper, and more because of AI, because we're able to do more. And lastly, a unitary structure, a one-brand structure rather than the multi-brand structure. That still plays well in this environment, but the pressure last year was on cost. You remember Mark Zuckerberg, year of efficiency. Mm -hmm. His stock, uh, Facebook stock, at one stage was about $80 to $90. It's now up at almost $400 within a year or within close to a year. So you've seen a tremendous emphasis on efficiency in 23, even with the platforms. Well, let me pick up on Mark Zuckerberg. He is busy spending money on chips, in particular NVIDIA yeah. chips at the moment. So if we paint the big picture, where does this leave the middleman? Because you've been one of the most successful middlemen in this market in advertising. But if the brands have all the data that they can do something with in future, they've got the insights as to what customers are doing, they can create their own video content, sure. their own advertising content, they can place those ads directly with platforms. What is the role of the middleman, the whole entire advertising industry in future? Well, I think back up for a minute and think about where AI impacts our business and Im impacts everybody out there at this conference. And there are five areas that we've identified. Visualization and copywriting. And what, what OpenAI, Sam Altman, announced last week by distributing Stora, S-T-O-R-A, the platform to a number of creators. What Stora does is converts text into pictures. Now, you couldn't play with Stora at the moment. You have four case studies that they've given, but it's basically text converting into pictures. So that really puts the cat, or potentially, puts the cat amongst the pigeons in visualization and copywriting. What took us three weeks literally can take us three hours. We as an industry sell time. We don't sell outputs and results, which we should do. We sell time. So naturally, clients and climate procurement departments are going to say, you're doing it quicker. It's cheaper. Let's share the benefit. So that's one area which is a plus and a minus. The second area is in hyper-personalization at scale. The work that we do for Netflix, example, which I think is the best, still the best data-driven iterative model that we have out there, the work that we did, say, let's say for Rebel Moon, which we just launched, we probably had about one and a half million different creative assets. With hyper-personalization and AI, that goes up by multiples of three, four, or five. So we're talking about millions of potential assets that you can use for hyper-personalized, we know that Karen likes soccer or Manchester United, or we know you're interested in business because you're on the CNBC <laughs> site, so we'll feed you pieces of content that play to your likes. We have the signals from the platforms. We have the first-party data. Remember, Google is deprecating third-party cookies this year. Apple has changed the IDFA rules to cohorts rather than individual IP addresses. So first-party data consented by consumers, getting over the privacy hurdle is absolutely critical, sort of coordinating those. So, so hyper-personalization is a big plus for us. The third area, media planning and buying, will be revolutionized by AI. We have 8,000 people in 32 countries. We don't have a media planning and buying network of 10 to 15,000 people, which each of the holding companies have multiples of. There are probably about 200,000 to 250,000 people working in media planning and buying. There won't be in two to three years' time. That How area, many will there be? Well, I don't know is the honest answer. My own view, and this is controversial, my own view is that AI will reduce the demand for employment the outputs, the machine-driven outputs, the permutations in media planning and buying will be better delivered by bots and by machines, but the interpretation of them will still be conducted by humans. So media planning and buying is going to move to the model that you mentioned. The platforms will develop closer relationships with enterprises. We've already seen it with Advantage Plus at Meta and Pmax at Google. These are programs, media planning and buying programs, that produce permutations that are helpful to small and medium-sized businesses. They won't disturb the enterprise ecosystem for the reasons that you point out yet, but in time they will, because hist historically, they could only replace the agency by bringing people into the equation. 
now with AI, people as, as the, the engine is not necessary. The, ro the bots, the media planning and buying net networks, AI driven will replace them. So that's the third area, and that will be revolutionary. For us who don't have networks, who are resellers for the platforms, that is a massive opportunity because we will validate the outputs from the AI platforms. The fourth area is general efficiency, and it's worth just mentioning the exclusive relationship we have in, with NVIDIA in the outside broadcasting area, which you're well aware of. If we want to transmit a football game or a cricket match or whatever it happens to be, or basketball game, we have to basically have an outside broadcasting truck. That costs $9 million. You amortize it if you're a network over five years at $1.5 million. The AI solution that we have with NVIDIA, with AWS and Adobe can deliver that at $100,000 to $200,000 a year. So you're talking about an 80 to 90% saving in outside broadcasting transmission using the cloud and AI. So examples like that of cost reduction are absolutely huge. And the final area that I think is the most revolutionary is knowledge transfer. We have about 900 people working on Alphabet and Google, about 300 working in on our NDA telecommunications company, heavily represented here in Barcelona. If we can get those people connected through AI-driven knowledge transfer solutions, that really flattens the organization and makes it much more efficient. All that adds up to a much closer relationship between the big platforms, the six that I've mentioned, plus Apple, plus Microsoft, plus NVIDIA, plus Salesforce, Adobe, and Oracle. Those, I think, are going to be the big winners, obviously, along with OpenAI, which is Microsoft's entrant into that, that area. I'm going to pick up on a couple of those points. Let me start with the cost efficiencies first. Yeah. The example you've just cited around broadcast, we know that these are very expensive industries, also under pressure from cord cutting, new competitors such as the streamers. What does that mean in terms of the pressures they face today? Can it make these businesses more viable for the future? You're talking about the linear networks. Exactly. Well, the linear networks are going to continue to have degradation. It is quite a unique situation that the CEO of a major linear business, Bob Iger in this case, announced on CNBC at the Sun Valley Conference last year that he wanted to sell the ABC network or, or even bring in a strategic partner hasn't done that as yet, interestingly, but you see that happening. You see that happening with Hotstar in India, which, which is the network that was formed by the fusion of Disney and Fox. And today, just on your competitive network, I saw the headline that Reliance and Disney have now signed an agreement in relation to the digital rights around IPL. That's what you're seeing continuously. The, the, the linear networks, trying to develop different executions, particularly in sport. I mean, the, the, the seminal event last year in sport, or this year in sport, has so far been the 123 million people who viewed the Super Bowl. What that told you was the linear networks, in this case it was Paramount, the linear networks have to embrace the digital part of the business and find executions using live sport and we're going to see, you know, over the weekend, I was spending some time in the Middle East talking about one of the, the biggest sports. And that particular sport, soccer, is going to have in the United States in 25 the World Club Championship, which will have a unique positioning. In the following year, we'll have the World Cup, the Men's World Cup, and in, not just in the US, but in Mexico and Canada. And then potentially, as a one in three shot, we'll have the Women's World Cup in 27. Then you have the Olympics in LA in 28. So North America, Mexico, and indeed Canada is going to be exposed hugely to live sport. That's a tremendous opportunity for those linear networks, but only if they embrace the connected TV executions. And you'll start to see also the retailers, you see Walmart, you see, uh, you see Boots, Walgreen, you see Target, you see others starting to embrace the first party data, 
walled gardens that they're building around retail advertising. So right. these are all executions that linear or traditional networks and retailers have started to develop in response to the growth of the streamers, the platforms, and indeed Amazon. And let me pick up on the other point around hyper-personalization. Yeah. Because it is one thing to be targeted with ads, it's another to see the creative process run into a wall. Is that what can happen with AI? Suddenly we have a lack of creativity as the machine just runs out of new ideas. Well, you know, the, the agencies will always argue, I mean, because it's in their self-interest, that creativity will be paramount. And that will be the big idea. I mean, the briefing for Stora, in the four case studies that they showed last week, one of them, were, for example, was of a Japanese landscape, two people walking down the street in Tokyo, volcanic snow-covered mountains in the background, snow on the trees, birds or whatever, it, you know, leaves on the trees or maybe not. And the, the brief developed the, the solution that the AI platform, in this case Stora, developed. Over time, and it won't be that long, because if you look at the development of a, com of a platform like Midjourney, 12 months or two years ago, it was very basic. Within 12 months to two years, it became extremely sophisticated. So Stora will be developed very strongly, subject to one constraint, which we've been talking about in our green room briefing, and that is the IP copyright pornography constraint. I mean, Google, for example, in Alphabet, hasn't released Gemini and it hasn't released Bard to under 18-year-olds. And the, the whole safety issue, privacy issues around the AI platform, and on the weekend, as I was saying to you, in the, the UK press, UK institutional shareholders are going to raise at annual general meetings of telecoms companies and the platforms about what they are doing on self-regulation of AI, which I think is the key. There is no way that the regulators, unless they court, they do ultimately breakups, of made it like we did with the baby bells and the oil companies, there's no way that the regulators are going to keep up with these companies. You know, Three trillion dollar market caps are equivalent to the German, almost to the German GDP or the Japanese GDP, certainly to the UK GDP. These are countries on their own and these technologies are going to ensure that they grow even more powerful and even stronger the regulators will not be, keep, be able to keep up. So self-regulation is going to be absolutely key. So when OpenAI launches Stora in an unregulated form, it sends alarm bells to other, other platforms and other tech companies in the industry. That is going to be a hugely important area which the platforms and the tech companies and the software companies are going to have to spend a lot of time doing, just like Facebook did ultimately in the privacy area. They have 35, 40,000 people monitoring editorial content. The same thing is going to have to happen in AI because like it or not, there will be bad actors. Half of the, the people on the planet are going to the polls this year. Well, whether we like it or not, there will be bad actors in various parts of the world who are trying to influence the results of those elections by using AI platforms to influence voting and voting patterns and motivation. So I think those companies have huge responsibilities to make sure that the self-regulatory aspects are under control. It is indeed a big political environment, a big election year all around Germany, for instance. We were just talking about it before. Even after years and years of grand coalitions, we're seeing fragmentation in politics. The US is clearly the big one we're watching and uh, likely potentially a Biden-Trump contest again after the weekend events in South Carolina against Nikki Haley, even in her home state. So what does that mean if we've got job disruption? Again, you've just spelled out to the industry, you know, if we've got job disruption, so people feeling like they're left out of the economic journey, combine that with deep fakes and uncertainty about where AI takes us. What does it mean for the type of environment well, we face? Well, the world, the, there are two things going on, we think. The world, as you know, is lower growth. The IMF came out with its, the World Bank came out with its projections of growth for the next three or four years. 
And like it or not, GDP growth is going to be less, it looks like, than we've experienced historically in the last 40 or so years, in the next four-year four year cycle. So lower growth, higher inflation than probably central banks want or you or I want as consumers, and higher interest rates than probably what we want as well, certainly what we've been used to. In that world, geographically, the world gets more fragmented. So in my view, our view, North and South America, the Middle East and Asia, with a qualifier over China because of Taiwan. If you're big in China, you know, if you're Apple and Tesla, and 15 to 20% of your sales come from China, which is probably the right weighting, because China is 20 trillion out of 100 trillion of worldwide GDP, America's about 28 trillion. So China and the US together are half the world economy, by and large. Asia, and then India, Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, the Philippines, Singapore, Malaysia are the, are the countries that benefit in a way from the growth in Asia and the concern about the Taiwan risk. Those areas become more and more important. Not good news, I think, relatively for Europe. Germany, France, Italy, Spain, and the UK face an environment. Most of the clients that I talk to, if not all, look at Europe as being a cost center, not a revenue growth area, which is an interesting thing. So the one, one issue or one challenge is to pick your markets carefully. In the old days, when the world was globalizing at a rapid pace, you know, following Ted Levitt's advice in 1983 in the Harvard Business Review, people, it didn't matter where you planted the flag. Now it matters where you grow. So picking your markets, the Middle East, obviously the highest growth area at the moment, Africa, full of potential, but too volatile for many, for many of our clients to stomach. So that's one thing. The second thing is, the demand for efficiency is going to intensify in that lower growth world. So AI, together with quantum computing, the cloud, the metaverse, the much maligned metaverse, which I think is now underhyped, not overhyped, what we see going on in entertainment, in music, in sport, in medical, in training, shoot, in working from home, working from anywhere, the opportunity around the metaverse despite the fact it was overhyped, is now huge in the context of what I mentioned with quantum computing and AI uh, and, 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 and the like. Those are huge opportunities to improve efficiency. So the second thing is improving efficiency. Geographical fragmentation and improving efficiency through digital transformation, AI-driven. Let me ask you quickly, many startups in the room, yeah. if you were a startup today, mm -hmm. would you be picking the United States over Europe because of regulation? Well, if you ask CEOs inside companies and some of the conferences I've been at reason, recently, the, the biggest thing they worry about, they worry about in America the southern border immigration. They worry about AI and the jobs issue and transformation. They, they worry about the geopolitical risks, whether it's US China, whether it's Ukraine and Russia, whether it's the Middle East. But the one thing that always tops the pole, the Slido pole, it is regulation. So, you know, I think what's going to happen maybe in November, certainly it looks like at the minute, I mean, the polls that I've seen, CEOs believe, two-thirds of them believe Trump will win if the poll was conducted today, and about 60% in November. We'll see how it plays out. There's still a long way to go, but I think generally, because businesses worry about regulation, that in the US, that gives Trump a significant leg up. Two things. He stands for lower reg, lower regulation, and lower tax. And right. the business community, like it or not, favor candidates that do that, whether they admit to it publicly or not. So I think on the regulation issue, you know, Europe will be at an increasing disadvantage. I want to from, talk about what's going on. It's right. not just regulation as well. It's, uh, Karen, it's also about stock exchange, risk, right. institutional attitude to, to risk, to, to focusing on the short term that I mentioned before, mm -hmm. rather than the long term. So if you're looking for funds yes. and you're looking for money, you naturally go, I mean, where, where do people go at the moment? They go to North America, 
and they also go to the Middle East. I mean, the Chinese now, because of the pressure that the Chinese government has put on the tech sector, has driven a lot of Chinese entrepreneurs. Where do they go? They go to Singapore, yep. and they go to the Middle East, to the sovereign wealth funds, and of course they go to America. America has become a, a, a fundraising ground for them that is more difficult because right. of the sanctions and because of the lack of relationship between US and China. Just quickly, I want to move on to the election of the future. Yeah. MIT, MIT piece was challenging us to think beyond deep fakes what the future looks like. They're saying, look, you could have a lot of political messaging developed by AI. AI, instead of focus groups, can go out there and work out what the key trigger points are so it can come up with campaigns, the exact points the campaign should be targeting. Uh, AI-based campaign consultancies in addition to that legislation that could be harmonized across countries, where at this point we've got, say, tax policy that could be done on a global sphere rather than done in individual countries, AI candidates, an AI party with human candidates. I mean, a lot of big changes here in terms of what AI could do. Does this, any of this ring a bell? Robotic po po politicians. <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, look, it goes back to the self-regulation issue. There will be bad actors. There will be people who, governments, uh, individuals who try and exploit candidates, who try political parties, that try and exploit the situation. I think the responsibility lies and will continue to lie and will become even more important for those companies that I mentioned. There will be, you know, you can never count Musk out. He'll be a player at significant scale because of SpaceX and Tesla. I mean, they're basically software platforms with hugely comp competent engineers that will develop. But by and large, the companies I mentioned will, I think, be the big winners and will continue the big winners. You know, we saw NVIDIA's yes. results last week. We saw the platform results the weeks before. I think that will continue to be the momentum. The, the response with power comes responsibility. It lies with them to regulate this from a, in, in, the, in the best way possible. Right. I think it's very difficult to build um, a cross-country, a cross-region legislation. I mean, the UK held a conference, as you remember, yes. about AI regulation. AI. I don't want to see the UK become an expert in AI regulation. I want to see the UK become an expert in finding AI solutions and developing startups and venture capital and indeed established companies as well to change their models to embrace AI in a sophisticated way. Going down the regulatory path may satisfy some politicians you know, at the ballot box or thinking that it might satisfy the electorate at the ballot box. That's not core in my view. In my view, we have to change the attitude that European institutions, both government and investment have, you know, as we see here in Barcelona. I mean, 100,000 people or whatever here to celebrate what's going on and inquire and develop knowledge about what's going on in telecommunications and the associated areas. So I think that's the more important focus rather than the regulation. And I think that you have to stimulate the companies to focus on this. Uh, Martin, we're out of time. We're going to have Thank to do you. this on Squawk Box on CNBC again instead. All right. Good Thank you so you. much. Sir Martin Sorrell, S4 Capital. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.